convenience of a digital mediated world. Blend Innovation offers informational webinars for our blend and broadband communities and open to anyone with an interest in using technology to improve community. Before we begin, I'll point to the chat box on the lower left corner of your screen. Interact with us at any time during today's webinar. You can simply type your question or comment in the chat box. So now let's get started. Again, my name is Mary Magnuson. I work here at Blenden Foundation administering the Blenden Community Broadband Program. Joining me today is Alex Glazebrook, Director of Operations for OATS, Older Adults Technology Services. Alex is responsible for ensuring an outstanding experience for the older adults who participate in OATS's many training and support programs. He manages the team of OATS trainers who collectively deliver thousands of hours of live instruction to seniors each year at dozens of program sites. He also leads the organization's efforts to identify and assess existing and emerging technology in order to determine its suitability for inclusion in OATS programming and develops new technology-based channels through which OATS can deliver its services. So take it away, Alex. Thanks, Mary. Um, and glad to be here today. Um, see, we have one participant so far, so that's exciting. Um, so yeah, as Mary said, I work for Older Adult Technology Services. Uh, our kind of customer-facing brand is Senior Planet. So most people, especially our participants and consumers and those who uh, you know, are part of our service catchment know us as Senior Planet. Um, it's kind of how we present ourselves to the uh, different people we serve. So um, today I wanted to kind of run through just a little bit of history about where we've been, what we've done, talk a little bit about our rural push that we spent the last two plus years doing in northern New York State. And then if there's time, um, I thought I would talk about a couple of lessons for the best practices for engaging older adults with uh, different forms of digital literacy because it comes in a lot of different shapes and sizes. And I think it's sometimes kind of uh, put into a catch-all that doesn't necessarily meet the needs of, uh, you know, the diverse population that uh, is encapsulated in 60 plus. So it's, you know, it's a big demographic that, um, you know, requires different modalities to address properly. So um, I am going to advance to the next slide here. Um, so Senior Planet and OATS has been around since 2004. Um, you know, these are kind of, what we do is we kind of take technology and um, make it approachable. So we engage people based on an initial impetus, which is usually technology related. So they usually have some kind of question or some reason for showing up at one of our many doorstops. They, you know, they want to learn maybe how to get photos off of their digital camera or off, the, off their smartphone, and then we help train them um, with age-appropriate programs using um, a lot of theoretical approaches from adult learning theory. So we meet people where they are rather than kind of instructing them about the best ways to do something. We kind of make it more of a didactic, interactive experience so people feel heard and they feel like their questions can be answered and that they're actually getting something out of it that's usable for their um, life. Uh, we don't just teach technology for the sake of teaching technology because that's it's really kind of pointless to do that, especially with people who are, um, you know, in the so-called third age of their lives. So um, we were founded in 2004, like I mentioned, and we spent the first five years of our existence doing training at partner sites around the New York City area. Uh, so we have, now we have over 100 partner sites um, in all five boroughs of New York City. We also have a footprint in uh, northern New York State, in the North Country region of New York State, which I'll talk about in a little bit, uh, Maryland, Florida, and a couple of other geographies that are coming online soon. Um, so from 2004 to 2009, we built labs. We kind of ramped up personnel, and we worked on getting a funding stream together that could support the diversity of the programs we offer, um, which took a long time. Uh, fortunately, we were uh, lucky enough to get 
a VTOP grant. Um, you know, after the recession, 2009, 2010, we were uh, we received one of the largest VTOP grants in New York State, and we're able to uh, kind of ramp up our programs. And that kind of was the next evolution, next step in our uh, path. So in 2012, we opened the Senior Planet Exploration Center, which was actually the first time we had our own program space. You know, prior to that, we had been partnering with senior centers and other faith-based organizations um, to deliver our training. So we were limited a little bit in how much we could control what we were doing. But Senior Planet and the BTOP grant gave way to kind of the next phase of our work because uh, the Senior Planet Exploration Center, which I'm sitting in now, is actually on 25th Street in Manhattan. So it's right kind of in the heart of New York City. And it's a beautiful space. Uh, go to the next slide so I can show a picture of what that looks like. Um, that photo on the top left is Senior Planet. So it's a really modern, accessible, uh, inviting space that people, you know, beyond just coming here to take programs, they come here to hang out, they come here to connect, they come here to collaborate. And uh, it's a really exciting place to be. You know, right now we have a bunch of volunteers from Google uh, in that big main space teaching participants uh, about the Google tools and the Google suite. So it's just kind of this, you might be able to hear them cheering right now. Um, but you, it's just a really exciting place to be. Um, and we kind of pride ourselves on having, from what we know, the only technology uh, themed, you know, senior space for, um, well, for older adults, obviously. In, in, the, in the world, we don't know of any others that exist that uh, have this exact um, posture. So, you know, it's really exciting. We, the, um, the map to my right here has, when we got that BTOP grant in 20, through 2010, 2012, we were able to actually build little computer labs in every borough as well. So we built the Senior Planet, which is the hub of activity, and then these extra computer labs that we also built um, at the same time, we constructed them in existing partner sites, but they're a little bit more controlled. We're able to, uh, you know, do more programming there, and we have staff there, and we offer kind of a, a larger range of activity than we would if we were just partnering with a site that didn't have one of our labs. So that was another exciting feature of what happened in this kind of second phase of our uh, lifespan. And then we also started doing mobile training, which is that photo on the bottom left where we started bringing uh, iPads around to different neighborhoods and doing training that way as well. Um, so we have seniorplanet.org is our website. It's kind of a lifestyle and content site. So it's more about, um, it's not so much about technology. It's more about what people are doing as they age and kind of, uh, you know, knocking or trying to fight back against the conception of what's possible as you age. So there's a lot of feature stories on there and things about people who are aging that you might not normally associate with aging because we kind of see aging as another phase in one's life and not, you know, kind of this uh, slow decline as it's portrayed in the media. So seniorplanet.org is a great resource. There's um, articles, content. It's a fantastic place for uh, people over 60 to go to turn for things that they can um, kind of see themselves in. Um, we do have Senior Planet U now, which is another uh, online, it's an online portal where we are delivering remote training and we also have the ability for uh, live streams through the platform and we use it as a blended learning tool in our live training programs. So that was kind of, that is, and now we're kind of in this um, phase where we're really seeking to leverage the power of our digital literacy efforts to make something happen. Uh, so we started focusing a lot on our five impact areas. So we have five impact areas at Oats. Um, 
creativity and lifelong learning, social engagement, health and wellness, civic engagement, and advocacy. Uh, so those areas really help us kind of orient our programs. Um, and they're important for constructing pathways for people where they're getting something out of the program that isn't just a hard skill. So when we say engineering change, we're trying to get people to use their newfound skills to do something. Um, so we've been focusing on our impact areas. We've been, uh, we created a whole set of metrics for assessing our programs that we developed in partnership with Cornell that can assess all of our programs in those ways so we really can measure change. We started pushing into rural communities, which I'll talk about in a minute. We're also in public housing developments uh, all through New York City now, where we're providing digital literacy training with an advocacy bent to people who are seeking to use technology to actually change their communities, um, which is really really powerful program. Um, and we started working more on getting more corporate support. So the things we're doing align with, um, you know, businesses in our arena that make sense. So we partner with people like Google and Dropbox and, you know, banks are starting to support us to help with financial literacy education and really kind of expanding our portfolio of uh, support and simultaneously enabling us to do more. So uh, we're still kind of in this engineering change phase, I would say. Um, you know, I think that this is kind of the crowning or the final evolution of where, you know, our programming always wanted to be. It's taken 14 years to get there, but now what we're doing is just really uh, it's very powerful and really life-changing for people beyond just kind of skills acquisition that is typically associated with digital literacy. Um, so these are just some photos. I throw a lot of photos in just so you can see things that we're doing. Um, the left is one of our digital entrepreneurs who built a business online from skills she learned here and now is supporting herself with this business called Opera Nuts. You could look it up, look it up online. Um, it's just really delicious. Uh, chocolate covered nuts that she made but it's a whole full-fledged business now and they're in big uh retailers like williams sonoma the top right i'll save because that's in the north country i'm going to talk about that in a minute and the bottom right is a lab we created in uh the queensbridge housing development which is in um, long island city and it's the largest public housing development in the northeast um there's uh so it's, it takes up six full city blocks, um, and we now are in there delivering a full range of programming there, um, which Activate is one of the ones I mentioned that is using their the issues in their community and using technology to put those two together to generate change. Um, and so I wanted to talk about since, uh, you know, the Blanda Foundation has a rural, you know, Benton, and we are, um, you know, really now I would say well versed in doing digital literacy for uh, rural communities. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about what we did and are still doing in the North Country region of New York State. Um, so in 2015, we were given a state grant to move our work north. Um, it's a pretty big project for us. Uh, we really weren't sure it was going to work. There was a lot of risk to it. And you know, two years later, we have a full running program with multiple partner sites, another senior planet center, and a really super engaged yet smaller community of uh, people who are participating. And this is a picture of so you know, senior planet in New York City is on the ground level, Street 25th Street, and up in Plattsburgh, New York, we had to find an area where we could, uh, where people congregated often and that wouldn't be too burdensome to get to with the weather because there's pretty extreme weather that far north in uh, New York. So we actually opened that senior planet in the Champlain Center Mall. So it's actually a big shopping mall 
um, and we're in a, one of the retail units there, and that's a photo of the space. And you can see it kind of maintains those uh, branding aesthetics. It's very modern. Um, this is just a quick map, so you can see it's a little zoomed out, but uh, this is New York State. These are the seven counties that border Canada, and then the red counties are uh, where we're doing the majority of our work, Franklin and Clinton counties. We have program space in Plattsburgh, and we have program space in Malone. Uh, so that's just to give you know, and it's very rural. Uh, the population we're working with in Plattsburgh, inclusive, uh, within a 10 mile radius, is just about 30,000. Uh, the population in Malone, which is a little further west, is about 15,000. So they're pretty small uh, immunities. And some of the even some of the other towns we're partnering with there have even smaller populations. Um, so this is our alternative to a partner site lab where where you have a full computer lab that has say 12 computers and desks. Um, this is called the Tech Spot, which we installed in Malone. That is this interactive uh, kind of, it, it's a wall unit, but it's so much more than that. Um, all of these cubbies open up and are just filled with different technologies for people to interact with. And we have iPads, tablets, drones, we have health equipment, we have telepresence robots, pretty much anything you could think of is in that unit. And it's a really fantastic way for us to interact with people in a rural setting without taking up too much real estate in an existing uh, program site. So that that the tech spot has been really, really, really successful. Um, and we find that it, it's kind of a great alternative to the traditional computer lab because a lot of times senior providers or other centers can't dedicate or allocate that much space. and we're able to do complete programming that we wouldn't do anywhere else with a full lab, but with this tech spot in the smaller uh, form factor. So that underneath the <coughs> large TV there, that's a rolling cabinet that pops up that has lo uh, locking charge stations in it that are full filled with tablets and laptops. And there, you can't see in this photo, but there is a whole set of um, collapsible tables that come out and we can teach all of our programming on. So it's really exciting. Um, and then the final component of the North Country is Senior Planet at Home. And that was also another first for us where we started going to people's homes and providing one-on-one -on -one instruction in their homes for people who have mobility impairment or some other uh, issue that's preventing them from excuse me, participating in our live training. So that also has been super, super successful. We uh, provide, for five weeks, we provide five 90-minute sessions to people in their home. We provide them with an iPad. We pro provide them with hotspot for connectivity if they don't have internet in their home, because a lot of people don't. Um, and we provide them with our course books and access to our online learning portal. So that is a really exciting program for us and has huge potential for rural geographies and rural communities that are, um, you know, really dispersed. Maybe people are not getting out as much. They can't come to a you know, congregate site. We can come to them. Um, and it's been very successful. Um, on this next slide, this photo here is a picture of uh, one of the first at-home participants, who her name's Sylvia, and uh, she's in her 80s. Recently, lost her husband about a year ago. Has some mobility impairments. Doesn't get out of her home too much. And we, you know, we found her by taking out advertisements in the local newspaper. And she responded and filled out an application. And she took our course. And now she has her own iPad. And she's able to stay connected at a much higher level than she was prior to us coming there. Um, and it also provides a lifeline to her if she's in distress. She has her iPad. Um, so it's really fantastic and opens up a lot of windows for people. Um, and this slide, too, kind of quickly recaps some of um, 
you know, the key metrics. We have 852 people enrolled through those two in those two counties, which is about 15% of the eligible population. So that's people 16 and above. Median age is 73, and you know, almost half of them have some sort of disability. Um, and 35% are living alone. So when you put those all those components together, you know, you have a aging population uh, where you know some of the communities up there are seeing percentages of their population that have older adults that are near 30 percent which is way higher than the national average so you know one in three people living in a lot of these regions in the north country of, of new york are older so and they're living alone and a lot of them are disabled so it you know kind of going in there with methods for engaging them and presenting them with information uh, that isn't just what we do in New York City was really important and I think we succeeded there uh, and are still succeeding. So, um, and you can see some of the other stats, you know, 83% uh, reported that their quality of life increased, 40% of the people that participated in our programs up there bought a device, 33% signed up for broadband, and 98% the net promoter score is whether you would recommend this uh, program to a friend or family member, and 98% of people said yes. So I think we've been really, really successful up there. Um, the program is strong. It has definite uh, relevance in other geographies, uh, other rural geographies in, you know, in the U.S., outside of the U.S. Uh, I think it could be a really, really powerful program. Um, you know, the, so the future of rural technology programs for seniors, you know, lessons are that the model works, it's replicable, it should be replicated, states should fund this type of uh, work, some do, you know, Minnesota is a good example, but there's still a lot of deficits and we're actually facing issues in New York State now where, you know, they're, they have a budget deficit and these are the types of programs they seek to get rid of first and it creates this kind of ebb and flow of access and then uh, blackness, if you will. There's just, they're become, you know, people get all excited, they take programs, they're becoming digitally engaged, and then there's this blackout period because the funding ends and we're unable to provide services anymore. So hopefully that doesn't happen in New York State, but there really needs to be, um, you know, a larger commitment from states and uh, you know I'd love to see a nat national policies that were more uh, focused on digital literacy and less on infrastructure because so much of the time and energy spent thinking about how we're going to wire the nation but no one thinks about or doesn't think enough about what that means once we're there you know how do we get people who live in you know uh, difficult geographies online using the service where's the money to support that so um, and, you know, I think that technology in rural settings is really powerful because a lot of these people we're interacting with are having difficulties that can be mediated with technology, access to resources, loneliness, isolation. Um, there's so many different things we can do with technology. And in rural settings, the, the issues are exacerbated even more so. And I think that not investing in digital literacy for rural geographies is just, you know, it's just such a detriment to those communities, especially since they're aging at more aggressive rates than the rest of the country. Um, so, you know, we would love, our goal is to replicate the program now to other rural areas uh, throughout the country. And we have a couple of leads where I'm, it's looking like that will happen soon, <clears throat> but we'd love to be able to do more. Um, you know, there is a new kind of the evolution of the of B top. There's a new uh, policy that's been proposed called B crop, which is it's broadband for uh, rural. But again, when you look through what's proposed, it's still very heavy on infrastructure and not enough on adoption. So it would be nice to see a policy that truly kind of integrated the infrastructure with the adoption as BTOP did, but at a higher level. So that was just kind of a quick recap of 
what we've been doing in the rural north country of New York State. So there are four lessons about technology for social change that I wanted to kind of run through quickly. This was sort of the uh, the bulk of the presentation, but I spent a lot of time talking about the North Country. So I'm going to kind of speed through this, and I know the deck will be available afterwards for people who want to look at it later. Um, but it kind of you know talks about our best practices and how we're we think about digital literacy for older adults and how it can lead to social change. So um, you know metrics matter is a big uh, one of the big things that pillars that we've been focusing on because what we found is um, a lot of the programs that are doing digital literacy are now validated in a way that they're measuring the right types of change. They might be measuring things like adoption or hard skill acquisition, but we wanted to get metrics together that actually were analyzing our content areas and were, you know, assessing whether or not people's um, people's change was actually coming from a place of empowerment and change in their actual life circumstance, you know, learning how to click a mouse or go to a website or make a website is fine, but what are you doing with that technology to kill us? So we've made metrics. It kind of was born out of a project we did uh, called Connecting to Community, which was reducing social isolation among older adults in Washington, D.C. and South Dakota, Sioux Falls. And we developed metrics there that are now being used across all of our programs to assess whether or not people's levels of isolation are being reduced by our programming. Um, these are a couple of pictures of people participating in the program. And this next slide shows, oops, next one, sorry. This next slide shows, uh, this is a peer reviewed report that's available. Um, a, the access to social support before and after participants uh, took our Connecting to Communities program. And you can see the, the blue is before and the red is after. So people felt like they had more social support after they participated in our programs, and we were able to measure that with the metrics we made. Um, and there's a lot more data that I won't drill into right now, but it was it's a way of making sure that what we're doing is actually creating change. Um, and these are some of the lessons we took away from that. Um, you know, these, these, these programs are tough, uh, especially people who are severely isolated. It's, it's sometimes difficult to create change to engage people properly. Um, and by holding you know, ourselves accountable through metrics, we were able to make programs that work and figure out how to measure it. And you know, creating a program that was made in partnership with the people it was serving, not just because we thought it was a good idea. Um, so connecting to community showed that it was possible. Um, this is probably my one of my favorite overlooked lessons of digital literacy, especially for older adults, because um, when people approach digital literacy with older adults, they often are framing digital literacy with in ways where they may, it, it becomes not important just by the way it's presented. So for instance, this is you know, this is the outside of a senior center in uh, northern Harlem. And on the right is inside what the computer lab looked like before we got there. You know, totally the facade is unappealing. Is And then you get inside and the computer lab is a mess. No one's paying any attention to it. There's no focus or energy placed on digital literacy. People don't design for it. So our whole stance is that you need to create inviting environments that want and seek to attract people and capture them and make them want to be there long term. So uh, you know our spaces look like this. 
which we already saw this picture, but Senior Planet, and this is a group of our students at Senior Planet. Very modern, appealing. It doesn't look like a some sort of you know facility or a prison. Um, the technology is all new, modern, clean, works properly. Um, here's some photos of what our site looks like in Plattsburgh, New York, the Senior Planet in Plattsburgh, New York. Again, modern feel, accessible. Um, there's no, you know, chains on the computers or things that prevent interaction with the technology. It's all meant to be completely accessible for people. Um, this was me a lot of years ago doing a lecture. You know, so we get crowds like this when we do just a lecture on how to choose a new computer online. We'll get 50 people sh showing up. And that still happens. This was in 2014, probably. And we're still getting that volume of people coming in to learn. Um, this is the registration line outside of Senior Planet. You would, you know, you at one of those facilities where people are doing uh, senior programming or other types of, you know, social service programming. There's never this type of demand, and I think a lot of that has to do with the ways it's presented and the ways that, uh, you know programming just in general is kind of presented to people there's not we have so much energy here and we treat um the programming as a very high quality service and then that what that does is it attracts people and keeps them coming back so it's really really successful um these are a couple of other photos of the center this was a uh we have all of our computers set up and then these are volunteers from google working with participants um, learning different features. This, I don't remember what they were learning specifically this day, but they come and work one-on-one -on -one with our participants to help them, you know, sort out issues specifically related to Google. Um, you know, so we, when we design for digital literacy, we think like a designer, but we also focus on the learner and what would make the most sense. So although our space is very modern and kind of looks like an Apple store, it's also still very accessible. So, you know, we have full accessibility accommodations for hearing and vision and, mo and mobility. So all the spaces people can get into, they're wheelchair accessible. Um, and, you know, we really want our program design to combat the notions of ageism. And what that what I mean by that is our program design is empowering. So people are feeling empowered after they take our programs. And I think that that's kind of the antithesis of aging ageism, because ageism frames people as worthless and old and incapable. But when they become empowered through our programs, it's they're completely bucking that trend and moving in the opposite direction. So, and a lot of that is due to the fact that the environment is providing them a space where they feel safe and can learn and become empowered. Um, this one is pretty obvious, uh, but I think plagues digital literacy, especially digital literacy for older adults. Um, a lot of technology is focused just on the technology. You know, let's learn how to click, let's learn how to browse, let's learn how to download files. Um, we do do that work, but as I mentioned, our programs are much more robust than that. So, so you know, this is an example of Team Senior Planet where we provide health and wellness programming to people, and it starts with learning the Fitbit, which is a device. That's, you know, kind of a hard skill. But what it builds into is a community of people who are seeking to get healthy and um, use the program to be communal and share their experience and hold each other accountable and go to the gym together and, you know, really work on something in a way that is different than if you just said, we're going to learn the Fitbit and this is what it does and leaving it there. So. Team Senior Planet's been running for about 18 months now, and we have people 
who exercise even when the program takes you know a hiatus or isn't in session they keep going together they wear their team senior planet jerseys that you can see they have on in their photo um, and there's some other really great photos here of people participating together and the program uses uh, certified fitness instructors and other uh, aging specialists to bring our participants to local fitness facilities to learn the equipment, to make sure they're tracking stuff on their Fitbit, to generate community amongst the participants, and just really, it's such a different uh, approach to digital literacy than if we just were focusing on the technology in and of itself. Um, you know, and you can see just on the smiles on the participants' faces there how much they're using this program more than just for, you know, tracking their steps with their Fitbit. Um, and, you know, they go on outings together. So this is them at a park. They go walking on the High Line, which is on the west side, if you haven't uh, been to New York City, where it's an outdoor walking area. Um, I see Mary said that she lost me there. Um, Still says I'm there. Joel, uh, Joel can hear me, but Mary can't. Uh, so I, I'll continue if Joel can still hear me. I don't know if Mary, it's I'm still getting the record icon while I'm talking, and it's the speaker is flashing. Um, so I'll keep going, I guess. It does seem to be dropping out, uh, but I'll keep going. So, you know, the lessons from technology is not an end in and of itself, is that they stay for the community, which is pretty much our theme throughout everything we do. Um, we're expanding people's definitions of technology. So I think in a regular or kind of run-of-the-mill digital literacy program, you wouldn't see the type of technology we're using so much. The stuff we're using is what everybody's using. So we use Fitbits, we use uh, smart home technologies, we use drones, and we find a relevance with uh, older adults. So I think that's a really important part of what we do. Um, you know, the group dynamics, I think, are really, really, really powerful. Uh, people use the groupiness and the group feel to stay connected and hold each other accountable for what they're doing. Um, and we also have a fair amount of structure and flexibility in our program, so we're not decreeing what people have to learn or what they should learn. We are creating a flexible program that generates community, that has relevancy, and eventually leads to empowerment. Um, and this last story here is about the work we are doing and have done in the public housing developments in New York City, where we uh, we're tasked with going to five housing developments in New York City, so it's subsidized housing for very large communities of people, and providing them with technology education in a way that a lot of um, people kind of thought wouldn't be possible. We actually did a whole door knocking campaign in Queensbridge, the largest public housing development out there. And uh, it really, it was difficult. It was hard to communicate with people and get our name out there. But we kind of persevered and knocked on 1,500 doors, which was every single residence that had an older adult in it. And we were able to create uh, a really robust program out there where we built a lab. We have a ton of people participating in the program and really taking to a 
different view of what they can be doing after they age because you know at first when we first got out there people thought we were trying to sell them something they're used to being uh kind of assaulted with scams and other marketing techniques so we had to kind of prove to them that we were there for the right reasons and you know the success you can see in these pictures is kind of is evident um we have hundreds of people enrolled the courses have all been adjusted to fit within um, the different communities' needs. So we're doing different levels of advocacy. We're changing the financial literacy programming to make it more relevant and presenting a package of programming that people really uh, are gravitating to. So it's really, really successful. And there's a couple of other images of people in the lab, in the computer lab here. Um, so that's one city. And then, because Queensbridge in and of itself is essentially the size of a city. Um, there's about 10,000 people in there in a 10 block radius. So it's a massive cluster of people. And then, you know, and then on the other side, basically on the other side of the river, we have Senior Planet where people are creating this is one of our entrepreneurs, another one of our entrepreneurs who used our programming to create an online business and started knitted goods online. And this was her presenting it to uh, a forum we held back here a few months ago. Um, so people are using the technology for different things, but either way, it's focusing on those uh, pillars of engagement, support, and you know, overall empowerment. Um, and that, you know, speaks to, you know, achieving multiple objectives without changing, you know, without compromising the program design. So like I mentioned, we actually change programs based on the geography we're in. So if, you know, we're in the rural north country or we are in New York City or we're in the housing developments uh, throughout the city, we will adjust our program. But just because it's adjusted doesn't mean it's compromised. Um, and I think a lot of our success stems from our ability to partner really well with existing institutions and other organizations that are doing the work. Um, that has been kind of our method of success because a lot of times I think programs fail or are unable to really reach kind of cruising altitude because they're not being collaborative and using the resources that are already there. So when once we marry that with our distinct, you know, view and take on aging, um, the the results and you know the ability to grow is really uh, exponential. There's no, you know, there's really no ceiling to it. So um, I think that was pretty much everything I was going to cover. Um, I kind of I thought there'd be with some more people, so I didn't want to have a full hour. Um, but happy to answer any questions <laughs> if anyone has any. No, it looks. It was really great, Alex, and I think that um, normally we do have a few more people than this. I'm kind of surprised, but you know, we'll we'll make sure that. Um, this gets posted so that people can contact you if they have any questions. I'm, so it should be good. I was just okay. kind of seeing it looked like Joelle might be typing, but I don't see anything coming up. Let's give her another second. Oh, there's, there you go. Sure, the at home Maybe program. Speak a little, yeah. 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 Um, so the at home program was really, uh, it was logistically very difficult. Um, to be totally honest, it was it was hard to get off the ground. Uh, we started small with ten participants, uh, five in each of those two counties in New York State. So I'll go back up to that map. So we had five in Clinton County and five in Franklin County, and they all had different stories and varying degrees of ability. Uh, we were working with someone who was paraplegic and actually had lost pretty much a lot of the use of their hands and we had to figure out a way for them to interact with the iPad uh, which we wound up doing with a, uh, a stylus that we kind of uh, transformed a little bit so we 
could interact with the device. But anyway, um, so the at-home program, we did kind of traditional marketing efforts. We took out advertisements in all the local papers and found people who we never would have met or seen otherwise. Um, and we went to their homes and interviewed them and had them fill out an application for the program to just understand more about their life. You know, what's going on? Why couldn't they, uh, you know, what was preventing them from participating in our services in person? And um, especially paying attention to people who maybe were uh, signaling symptoms of isolation or loneliness. Uh, they were given priority in the program. And, you know, we had the first round, we had about 30 people. Uh, and we've selected 10, so, and we're now starting a second batch of people coming up uh, th at the end of this month. And they, they received five 90-minute sessions in their home over five weeks. Uh, they receive, their, we loan them an iPad, we loan them a hotspot for free, uh, and we pay for all the data that they use for those five weeks. And we also give them our full course books for where um, we've been doing iPad basics training just to get them kind of ramped up. Um, and then we also give them access to our online learning portal, which uh, they are able to complete activities and interact with other participants during the, you know, the weeks, the weeks in between their uh, learning sessions. And, you know, it's been really, really successful. Um, you know, it, I, it was very hard to get off the ground. We are running into issues where um, taking back the devices is difficult because unfortunately we, we can't give that we can't give them to them permanently we would want to but they're uh since it's state funded it's actually state property so we've run into some issues where people you know understandably don't want to give up their device after having it for five weeks and there's been some other issues with uh there are areas up there where you actually can't get uh lte service so our hotspots don't work, and they're, they simultaneously don't have uh, any kind of internet availability, except for maybe like HughesNet, and they may have not opted into that. So they, we can't provide any level of connectivity at their home. So that's been a little bit of a challenge as well. Um, but you know, overall, I think that at scale, um, the program could completely revolutionize uh, in-home service delivery for uh, mobily impaired or otherwise impaired older adults. Um, we also have roving vehicles up there that we've equipped with uh, that are LTE enabled. The, the cars are LTE enabled and they also are loaded up with technology. So we kind of rove around doing the at-home sessions, popping into community sites and doing lectures, so it kind of becomes this kind of integrative, uh, multi-pronged push, and at home is just part of it. But I, it's probably been, we just actually got a new participant um, just a few days ago who was 102, and she was a World War II technician. Um, and she's wheelchair bound, can't leave her home, but totally cognizant and wants to participate. So we're now, you know, she's now our oldest participant. So it's it's a really exciting program. All right. Well, uh, thank you, Alex, for a really interesting and informative program today. And you know, thanks for being here with us. Um, yeah. Thank. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Um, Oaks and Blind Foundation don't really have a working, uh, formal working relationship, but you know we were happy to see you at the conference last year. Yeah, of course, that was fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, all right. Well, I guess well, thank we'll you. close it out then. All right. Um, this is normally where I'd mention. Yeah, this is normally where I'd mention next month's webinar, but our broadband team at the Blinden Foundation has decided to go with more of an ad hoc schedule rather than schedule regular monthly webinars. So that being said, any suggestions are welcome. You can email ideas to me or Bill Coleman or to broadband at blindenfoundation.org, and we'll let everyone know next time we hold one. Thanks again, Alex, and thanks um, 
for attending today's webinar and have a great rest of your day. Thank you.